Hello, my name is Jessica Hong and I'm an alumni committee member at the Harvard Chan School where I graduated in 2020 from the Doctor of Public Health or DRPH program. To all the alumni and friends out there who are joining us, we're excited to welcome you to today's alumni lightning talk. It's my pleasure to now welcome our featured speaker. Dr. Nema Kaseje received her MPH from the Harvard Chan School in 2008. She's a pediatric surgeon and public health specialist with expertise in building pediatric surgical care delivery, having worked in Kenya, Haiti, Congo, uh, Central African Republic, Liberia. At Doctors Out Borders, she was part of the first cohort of surgeons stationed to the first pediatric surgical program by a humanitarian organization. Dr. Koseje was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum, has been actively involved in the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery, and has been appointed the focal point for the World Health Organization, the WHO's program in emergency and essential surgical care. She's the founding director of the Surgical Systems Research Group, leads the Welcome Trust funded COVID-19 intervention, and is currently establishing the first pediatric surgical operating room in a refugee camp in Kakuma, Kenya. In fact, Dr. Kaseji is speaking to us all the way from Kakuma, Kenya today, where she's currently doing her field work. So I'd be remiss to say how fortunate we are to have this opportunity to hear her insights. Dr. Kaseji, over to you. Thank you so, so much, Jessica, for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And it's an honor to reconnect with the Harvard Chan community. And it is a privilege to discuss how we are rising to the challenge of practicing public health in a changing, changing world. And in particular, it's, 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 it's a great um, delight um, to discuss um, some of the work that we're doing, the challenges that we've come across, the solutions that we're implementing as we deliver life-saving pediatric surgical services in a complex refugee setting. In terms of the structure of my presentation, I will begin by describing our context. I will then go through some of the challenges that, that we are experiencing and the solutions that we've implemented. I will then um, discuss the impact we've had so far and also next steps and, and our roadmap. And, and, and I hope many of you will consider joining us in, in this effort. So in terms of the global context, um, globally, 5 billion people lack access to surgical services. And out of those 5 billion, 2 billion are children, including displaced and refugee children. This year, in May of 2022, we reached the devastating milestone of 100 million people displaced globally. 10 million people were displaced for, from Ukraine, in the Americas, more than 7 million have been displaced. And according to recent numbers, uh, many are, are fleeing El Salvador and Guatemala, especially. On the right-hand side, um, you will see that many refugees are hosted in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll go through the example of Kenya. Kenya hosts about 600,000 refugees, about 234,000 are in Dadaab, Another 230,000 are in Kakuma refugee camp where we're located and 90,000 are in Nairobi, our capital city. As you can see from the map, the refugee camps are located in very remote and rural parts of the country. Uh, Kakuma is in the extreme Northwestern part of the country. Um, Dadaab is in the Southeastern part of the country. When you look at the numbers uh, on, on, on the top panel, you'll see that the vast majority of refugees are women and children. And if we take our, the example of Kenya, 76% of refugees are women and children from South Sudan, from Somalia, and from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is a picture of Kakuma refugee camp. As you can see from this picture, the climate is very dry. Uh, it's very rural, uh, so Kakuma refugee camp is close to the borders with South Sudan, um, with Ethiopia, and also Uganda. Poverty is very high, 70% of the population lives on less than $2 per day. Malnutrition, communicable diseases, and malaria are very common. 
And as you can see on the right hand side, um, Kakuma and Turkana um, are suffering uh, from severe drought and, and malnutrition rates have gone up drastically uh, because of, uh, because of uh, dry weather, uh, the lack of rains, and, and also because of increasing energy prices. Uh, and, and so as you can see, uh, Kakuma and Turkana are one of the 10 counties in the alarm zone. So very often, current humanitarian interventions um, focus on malnutrition. Um, they focus on communicable disease outbreaks, and those are very important. Uh, but what we forget is that refugee children also present with surgical conditions. They present with injuries and disabilities um, due to the conflict and the violence that they've experienced. Um, they present with congenital anomalies. Um, they also present with acute surgical emergencies. They also present with cancers and access to surgical services for these refugee children is very, very limited and often non-existent because of gaps in the health system. There's an insufficient workforce. Um, specialists do not go to these areas. Uh, there's inadequate infrastructure, inadequate equipment. Refugees also present with unique barriers. Often they don't speak the lo local language. Um, they don't have the financial resources to seek uh, specialized care because they do not have access to, to employment and other economic activities. And then when we consider the patient perspective, um, surgical patients in these center, settings tend to be more complex uh, because they not, only, they not only present with a surgical disease, but they also present with malnutrition. Uh, they present um, with uh, communicable diseases because they've missed some of their vaccines. Uh, so for example, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we were dealing with a measles outbreak uh, because many children have missed out on their routine uh, vaccines. So I've described many of the challenges. So what are the solutions? We found that what is key is health systems strengthening uh, for safe surgical care provision. This requires investments in infrastructure. It requires investments in equipment, uh, pediatric surgical equipment. It is critical to build a local surgical workforce so that we can move away from the fly in, fly out model of care. Com a community strategy is critical to optimize the detection of cases and the referral of surgical cases. It is also very important to advocate uh, for services, for more comprehensive services to get political support and, and subsequent financial support, not just from the Ministry of Health, but also from the Ministry of Finance. And this is exactly what we've done in Kakuma Refugee Camp. We've invested in, in building pediatric surgical infrastructure. We've invested in, in pediatric surgical equipment. We are working very hard to build a local surgical workforce uh, so that care can happen close to the communities in need. And so far over time, we've been able to, to care for younger and younger patients. And, and also uh, we've been able to care for more complex pathologies. So if you look at the left upper picture, uh, this is a picture of Sabah, a five month old baby uh, with, with a blood defect that we were, able to, uh, we were able to repair. And this is two days after her surgery and she's doing very well and she's gone home. In the left lower panel, this is Egalan, a five-year-old girl uh, with a very determined mother who walked 100 kilometers um, to reach us um, to get surgical services for Egalan. Egalan is, is also doing very well and she's back in kindergarten. And so our services are inclusive. We're not only taking care of refugee children, we're also taking care of the Turkana children and the Turkana community historically uh, is a nom nomadic community and they remain uh, nomadic and they have been left behind so far. So they are also in need of these life-saving uh, surgical services. We have a community strategy and we've engaged um, with, with communities, uh, both the refugee community and uh, the Turkana community, uh, working closely with community health workers so that we can optimize the detection and the referral of cases. And also uh, working with community health workers allows us to also optimize the post-surgical care um, once the children go back to their homes. 
In terms of the impact, in just six months after installing the equ equipment and the infrastructure and building the capacity, we've seen the th a 37 percent increase in the number of children uh, getting surgical services, and we are on track uh, to increase uh, to double this uh, by December of 2022. And so we are making progress. But it is not enough. We need to do more uh, to deliver comprehensive uh, child health services in the refugee context. And so we've, we've developed a roadmap and we're working very hard to deliver on this roadmap. And our plan is to conduct a comprehensive integrated baseline assessment of current, health, current child health services, um, looking at outcomes, current outcomes, using both quantitative and qualitative methods so that we can get a better understanding of the true burden of disease and, and the gaps that are there. As we do this, we will be engaging with stakeholders, uh, including uh, the UN agencies, uh, the ministries of health, both national and subnational. Uh, we'll be engaging with NGOs and academia um, to develop more comprehensive child health services, taking into account results from our baseline assessment. Uh, once we do that, we are hoping to design an integrated uh, intervention uh, to um, optimize compre uh, comprehensive child health services uh, in Kakuma refugee camp. And as we do that, we will of course may measure the impact uh, using both quantitative and qualitative methods. And obviously as we, as we generate evidence, we will continue to engage with policymakers and practitioners um, so that we can change the status quo. The status quo right now is that there's still a focus on, on malnutrition and on communicable diseases, uh, but these children also need surgical services and, and we, can't, uh, we can't ignore that anymore. And so we're very keen to partner with others, uh, join forces with others who would be interested in, in joining us um, so that we can uh, achieve equity in child health services. I'm very grateful for our clinical team on the ground and our research, research team on the ground. Uh, they've been working very, very hard uh, to deliver for our patients. I'm also very grateful for our current partners, including the Ministry of Health, uh, UNHCR, uh, IRC, uh, the Tropical Institute of Community Health, which was founded by another Harvard Chan uh, alumnus uh, from class of uh, 1978, uh, Professor Kaseji. And please do not hesitate to contact me. I'm, I'm very keen to have further discussions with fellow alumni, with current students, uh, with faculty members. And so my email address is there and my Twitter handle is also there as well. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to join you remotely. Uh, many thanks to the organizers um, and I look forward to joining you in person very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasinche, for that very important, very important and very inspiring presentation on how you've been improving pediatric surgery care in the Kakuma refugee settlements. I was fortunate to have the opportunity to, to do some field work um, there as well while I was a student at the Harvard Chan School. So definitely appreciate how important work like yours is to address the situation there. If it's okay, I'd like to ask you a couple follow-up questions. Uh, so, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You've shared with us how we unfortunately live in this time of massive displacement. Um, and I was wondering about how your work can inform pediatric surgery care delivery for situations in Ukraine, El Salvador, and Guatemala, as you've described to us. Um, mm -hmm. Also thinking about places we've been hearing about in the news, like Ethiopia, mm -hmm. Yemen, mm -hmm. Syria, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we may see even more displacement in the future mm -hmm. due to climate change and related tensions. Mm -hmm. What is some of the potential to apply what you've been learning on this initiative to other humanitarian contexts? Um, so that's that's a very important question, and and thank you so much for for asking that question. Um, and so when I think about what we're doing, um, I've also come to the realization that the challenges that we are facing are are common in many other contexts. So whether it's Ukraine, whether it's uh, Myanmar, whether it's 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 Somalia, it's women and, ch and children. Who are bearing the brunt of, of conflict, violence, and persecution. So that's number one. 
Number two, uh, we see the same gaps in the health system. And, and so that is an insufficient workforce, uh, either because uh, they have also fled uh, or because they've been harmed as well. Um, we also see the health system may have gaps also because of uh, uh, the attack of, of hospitals that we're, we're seeing now, um, and that some of those humanitarian laws are not being observed uh, by different actors. Um, so those hospital buildings will no longer exist because they've been destroyed. You will no longer have the equipment uh, or, or the infrastructure. And so those challenges uh, you will see in many of these contexts. And so when it comes to the solution, uh, you just have to rebuild. You have to rebuild the workforce. You, you have to rebuild the infrastructure, the equipment. Um, you also have to focus on maintaining peace. And, and so that requires uh, multiple partners to be involved uh, because the other issue is that some of these conflicts are, are now protracted. Um, it's, it's not two or three years anymore, uh, but it's 10, 15 years, you know, if we look at the example of Syria, for instance. And so we need to move away for that emerge move away from the emergency response um, uh, model of doing things. And we need to start building systems, uh, building systems um, so that we can respond to the acute emergency, uh, but then also build systems uh, so that uh, populations can return. And, 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 and that can also uh, feed into, into peace building and, 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 and also uh, providing the next generation uh, with the basic services that they need. Thank you for that very thoughtful summary of, of some very complex challenges. <laughs> uh, there's so much you've already been able to figure out how to do well. For example, your ability to engage all these different stakeholders, including yeah. some of the other fan schools still, and this wonderful inclusive approach where you're working with not only refugee children, but also children from the host community. Yes. Um, to hear more about um, what you see as some of the pressing remaining challenges for humanitarian pediatric surgery care delivery. Um, so uh, part of the challenges is, is at the policy level. Um, so convincing other actors that uh, this is a worthwhile investment. Um, uh, for a long time, we've done the basics, you know, getting everyone vaccinated, uh, get, getting everyone fed. Uh, but that's not enough. So we can't feed a child and vaccinate a child. But the minute they have uh, acute appendicitis, we say, no, that's it. We can't do more. So we need to challenge ourselves to do more uh, at the policy level. Uh, we also need to challenge ourselves to do more um, in, in terms of implementation and how we do things. So we need to be more comprehensive. We need to have a more complete uh, uh, package of, of services um, so that you know every child can attain uh, their full potential in, in terms of health and in terms of, uh, of, 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 of how, you know, because if with a disability, they can't go to school. So it has a huge impact on what lives they'll lead in the future. And so I urge everyone um, that we, we do more than just the basics uh, and be more comprehensive uh, so that we can give this, these children uh, a chance, a chance to live uh, full lives and a chance for them to be contributing members of, of society. Definitely wishing you and your team the, the best as you tackle these remaining challenges to give these children the most holistic, best, quality care possible and um, as you go about saving all the lives that you that you can for the alumni who are who are listening and who are interested what are some of the ways that people can learn more get involved in, and support this important work to to make sure that this gets as far as it can go um, so obviously they can get in touch um, as I mentioned earlier we are working very hard um, to mobilize resources uh, because it, it takes money. So if, if anyone uh, has any links um, to resource mobilization, uh, we're happy to hear about them. Um, we're also very, working very hard from uh, you know, the, the perspective of generating evidence um, so that policymakers uh, can take action. Uh, so if anyone is interested in contributing their, 
their skills uh, in quantitative methods and qualitative methods, um, they're more than welcome to, to join. Um, we are doing a lot in, in terms of capacity building. So if there are any clinicians who would be keen um, to join us, um, that is also another a possible way of contrib contributing to our efforts. Um, so just, they can just feel free to, to reach out um, either via email or, or Twitter. Um, and I'd be happy to address any questions and to also talk about uh, any potential collaborations. Thank you. I really hope to see some, some fruitful collaborations emerge from, from this um, so that you all can keep doing this wonderful work to, to save lives. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaseje, for making the time to join us today all the way, all the way from Kenya. Mm -hmm. Um, and to everyone who's listening, I encourage you to check out the other alumni lightning talks as well as um, and the rest of the alumni weekend programming. Thanks again, everyone. Please stay safe and, and take care.